I'm Craig Hamilton. I'm a PhD research student at the uh, School of Media in, at Birmingham City University. And I'm just over halfway through my three-year PhD, which is um, funded by the AHRC Midlands Three Cities programme, and during which I'm looking at popular music consumption through the development of um, my Harkive project. Before starting, I'll briefly explain what Harkive is and what's happened so far. Um, it's an online crowdsourced method of gathering stories from music listeners um, that invites them to tell the story of their music listening on a single day each year through various online channels including social media, photo and video sites, good old fashioned email and a bespoke platform. Um, Harkive, if you haven't kind of worked it out already, is a completion of two words, hark to listen and archive uh, of stories. Um, the project ran for the first time in July 2013 when it was my final project for my MA in music industries at BCU, then it ran again in 2014 and 15, and will run again on the 19th of July this year. It's so far gathered around 8,000 uh, unique stories, ranging from tweets to long-form essays, and has received um, coverage in a few media outlets, including the Today programme, World Service, Five Live, and Enemy, and a few other music publications. Um, the main challenge of my PhD is to devise a method of making sense of what is a an unwieldy but nevertheless fascinating data set about contemporary music consumption practices. So I'm going to start my paper with an account of a personal experience uh, that kind of kick-started some work that I've undertaken intended to help me understand the growing role of data on the music, popular music experience, particularly through digital interfaces. Uh, I'll then illustrate a model I'm working on um, uh, that I'm developing towards that end of understanding these technologies. And I'll illustrate that with a case study of Spotify's Discover Weekly, which is a, a machine-derived curation service, um, before closing by looking at some of the issues with that uh, as a means of informing the development of my study of popular music listening. So, um, during the course of my everyday life, I'm almost always accompanied by these things. I use headphones on my iPhone to listen to music via my Spotify subscription or to live or catch up shows on the BBC iPlayer. So this kind of normal everyday activity generates a good deal of potentially useful data related to my location, the media I consume, the kind of data is referred to as unobtrusive data. You know, I don't kind of uh, voluntarily hang it over, but it's a kind of condition of using these services that this data's gone. Um, and that's kind of, whether you listen to music or not, any kind of online media consumption, this is a, a sort of a state of affairs that's common to many, many other people. So uh, recently, a song popped up in my Spotify Discover weekly list, uh, and for various reasons that the format of this talk doesn't allow me to elaborate, elaborate upon, it very nearly reduced me to tears on a packed commuter train, which is quite embarrassing. Um, and what's interesting about this incident is that that nar narrowly averted public emotional collapse was, in part at least, algorithmically generated. Um, of course, the same thing could have happened had the song been played on the radio, but it wasn't. It was situated instead in a personalised playlist and one that was generated for me by a machine performing analysis on data about me and many others. So in that sense, it was quite unlike a shared experience as, uh, or a public one. It was a, it was a private one that kind of spilled over or almost spilled over into a very public one. Um, so this led me to think about the extent to which data is producing our uh, musical experiences in online environments and how that might spill over into popular uh, music culture more generally. And I began to realise that I needed a way to kind of to try and understand these effects and um, this led me to a problem um, and a limitation with my own knowledge uh, and experience as it relates to both the data I've collected um, and in terms of these uh, data-related technologies and interfaces more generally. So the, the problem, as I would define it, is I'm, I'm a reasonably tech-savvy media scholar, but I'm not a data scientist or a coder, yet here I am in the middle of a PhD project that's increasingly data-heavy. So in terms of popular music and, uh, uh, and more widely, I needed to try and sort of get inside some of these technologies um, to perhaps, you know, I thought that was my best route forward to try and understand the cultural effects of them, perhaps. Um, so I spent a lot of time kind of reading and I've been developing this model 
uh, which I'm currently digesting a bit more and attempting to turn into something a bit more coherent. Um, essentially though, I'm trying to paint a picture of a circular process where data is both the raw material and the result, where when we are, as Michael and Lupton have described, simultaneously the informant, the informed and the information. And I'm trying to convey also the idea of this continual constitution and reconstitution in what Morris points out is the recursive loop between interaction with and recommendation of cultural goods under the gaze of uh, datification as Schoenberg and Kukia define it. Um, I'm also trying to get a sense of the private and the public and of knowledge and access, uh, which we can understand more broadly in terms of what Boyd and Crawford and various others have described in terms of a big data divide. So although this model requires a lot more work and I'd, I'd love to hear your feedback on it, um, as a starting point I'm finding it quite useful because it enables me to start to go beyond some of the more nebulous and high level conceptions of big data and to start to critically examine some of what I see as the constituent parts. So for example, Gitterman enables us to look at the notion of data and its perceived objectivity. Anna has done some work on, the ethical on an ethical framework for algorithmic accountability that can help us kind of start to understand some of the knowledge generation activity. Uh, I saw Nathaniel Katz speak last May at the Politics of Big Data conference and he gave an excellent paper where he showed you know, that once individual behaviour can be reduced to a data value, anomalous action can be corrected by interface design. So in other words, the possibility for deviant behaviour can be written out of the system. So thinking about popular music in those terms, we can understand Spotify and similar services, in part at least, in terms of, be, uh, of being a response to the piracy that disrupted industrial practice around the turn of the century. But um, it also raises questions about how this kind of new and souped up variant of a knowing capitalism might potentially affect the kind of music we hear when following Alan, economic morality meets a bounded diversity. Uh, Bernard Reader, speaking at the same conference as Nate, uh, argued that we shouldn't view big data systems as uh, sets of technologies, but as performative forms of function, which, um, following Hernstein Smith, can be seen as kind of important dynamic elements in a system of value creation. So um, this framework kind of enabling me is enabling me to look a bit more critically at the thing that nearly made me cry, uh, Spotify Discover Weekly. Uh, when it was launched last year in July, it was described by the company as two hours of custom-made music recommendations tailored specifically to you and delivered as a unique Spotify playlist. This is the line I like the best. It's like having your best friend make you a personalised mixtape every week. Um, the first thing here is that uh, there's, like an, there's an interest in rhetoric going on. Uh, one Edwards at all have described in terms of the ongoing construction of good and bad music consumers. Um, uh, at the point of what Burkhart has characterised as the new loci of exchange of music consumption post Napster, which Spotify is a prime example. So good consumers are those who pay their monthly fees and the bad ones are those who rip music from YouTube. In what's a fairly reductive binary, given that very few people would fit that in the present landscape, which uh, Noack has characterised, I think, accurately as fractured and heterogeneous. Um, but we can also see how some of the often hidden processes of companies operate in what Hartman at all have called data-driven data business models are often encapsulated within interfaces that are packaged to consumers as experiences described in terms such as custom-made, tailored, personalised as Spotify have here, um, or in synonyms such as curated and bespoke, which a lot of other companies use. What's also doubly problematic in terms of uh, critiquing this thing is that uh, Spotify Discover Weekly is, you know, it, it's pretty good at what it does if you've, if you've used it. It's quite good at a as a recommendation service, so that makes it tricky to look at it uh, kind of objectively when actually it is making some quite good recommendations. Um, so a closer examination of how it works in terms of the model I've been developing uh, also raises other interesting questions, and I'm taking much of what follows from interviews with Matthew Ogle, who's the lead developer behind the project, and from uh, various articles in the tech music press that attempt to explain the mechanics of the service. Uh, but putting it first of all into some sort of industrial cultural context, uh, Spotify was launched in 2007. It's based largely on the same uh, 
peer-to-peer -peer technologies that uh, the likes of Napster harnessed. It offers users access to a large catalogue of recorded music licensed from rights holders through an interface that's available on a number of platforms including mobile, desktop, tablet and, and smart TVs. It's available on either a free uh, or uh, ad supported or through a premium subscription model. And of the reported 75 million users, around 30 million are on the premium tier service. <coughs> According to RIA figures, which uh, you, know, you can take with a pinch of salt, but the um, streaming or access models such as this now represent the primary income stream for music rights holders and they contribute to sort over of 34% of total revenue. Um, another key thing to understand about curation and experience as features of these access model interfaces is that they represent perhaps the, the final frontier of competitive advantage. Um, sort of anecdotally, I would describe the situation we're in now as the Highlander phase with music streaming um, and more than one of the many streaming services in the marketplace are going to become Sean Connery in the next um, 12 to 18 months, I would have said. Uh, Apple, Deezer, Tidal are all operating in, a spa in that space. YouTube Red and Sp SoundCloud Premium have recently entered it. Facebook are allegedly waiting in the wings. And they're all, all of these services are offering metered access to pretty much the same catalogues in the same or similar ways and at largely the same price point of £10 a month. Ogle himself recognises this and says that I think music catalogue is more or less commoditised at this point. So beyond perhaps initial customer base and subsequent marketing spends, the quality of the experience offered is really the only scope these companies have for leverage. And this is kind of where Spotify Discover Weekly comes in. Um, so how does it work and what are the potential issues with it? Um, firstly, Spotify has detailed information on 75 million users. So in very simple terms, it can divide its catalogue of 22 million songs into those that you've played and those that you haven't with the latter being the pool from which the Discover Weekly songs are taken. And along with that simple binary, data is also collected on which songs are skipped, shared, added to playlists and so on, each of which offer deeper insights into a perceived, level, perceived levels of what they refer to as affinity. Um, further to this, Spotify uh, acquired the self-defined music intelligence company Echo Nest, which uses web crawling technologies and natural language processing to analyse evolving con conversations online which augment the metadata Spotify all already has about the catalogue. So along with industrial information related to rights holders such as artist name, label information and so on, Spotify also has information on tempo, key arrangement and also detailed descriptive uh, information that can further granularise user taste profiles. Um, and the final piece of the jigsaw is what Ogle refers to as the atomic units or the common currency of the Spotify ecosystem, which is the two billion user-generated playlists created since 2007. Um, this provides them at huge scale with data on the manner in which users make sense and meaning from a vast catalogue of music. So that means which songs go well together even if they're from different genres, which songs occur on playlists with the word summer or running in the title, and which of these playlists is popular with whom and so on. Um, so that combination of user and catalogue data uh, put together with the insights culled from two billion human-generated meaningful configurations of songs, enables the weekly automatic creation of 75 million playlists. Uh, the process runs every Sunday. Each user wakes up on Monday morning to 30 songs they've never listened to before in the Spotify interface. Uh, and Ogle, of, Ogle and his team arrived at the figure of 30 songs, or roughly two hours, iteratively during the development, as they felt that was more human and approachable. Um, they also incorporated the delivery of these playlists into the native Spotify interface, so there's no kind of cosmetic difference between a Discover Weekly playlist and one that's been created by uh, a user. <coughs> In the first 10 weeks of it being available, over a billion songs were streamed from these playlists, a figure that almost doubled uh, by December of last year. And in addition, Ogle has claimed that 2,000 artists derive uh, around 80% of their, revenue, their Spotify income um, from appearing on these Discover Weekly playlists alone. And buoyed by the success, uh, the company plans to roll out similar, what they call appointments to listen, uh, generated by algorithmic processes in the near future. Um, I thought at this point it might be interesting to share a cross-section of the Twitter comments that appeared this Monday, this Monday just gone, showing reactions to the newly released edition of the playlist. Um, most of these 
a positive. Everyone in this room, I'm sure, is down with the kids, so you won't need me to explain to you that um, Spotify Discover Weekly was fire this morning um, is a compliment. Um, a handful of these uh, were, were negative, um, but it gets kind of interesting where you know some people often qualify that negativity um, by by saying that it's partly their own fault. You know, um, every time my Discover Weekly playlist sucks, I blame myself. Like, damn it, Katie you listen to too much Carly Rae Jepsen. Um, others, interestingly, um, talk about um, an algorithmic interface in distinctly human terms. So, I want to meet a girl who knows and loves me like my Spotify Discover weekly playlist. Uh, or I can tell the algorithm isn't, isn't happy with me. So, uh, on a side note, um, related to, uh, which are related to the difficulties in, inherent in my own project, uh, this fairly unscientific, fun example highlights some of the issues around what Gerlitz calls the specific grammars of action that need to be considered when you're collecting data from a lot of different online platforms. But that's another story. Um, back to the paper, and in terms of an examination of present day experience of popular music listening, such as the one I'm engaged in, what are the issues and questions that present themselves based on what we've seen, and what form might such an inquiry take place? Uh, take um, the first issue as I see it, uh, and it's one that maybe has scope beyond the field of popular music, revolves around a dual point. Um, first is that you know, following Nancy Bain's work is what appears to be the fairly rapid domestication of these technologies where, as she says, tech goes from wild to tame and gets laden with meaning, meaning along the way, which we can see in some of those um, tweets from the users. But also a question of... Uh, of to what extent and in what form the social shaping of these technologies uh, might take. And I, I made a note when Tony gave his paper earlier when you mentioned activism. I, w I wonder whether there's the scope for people to kind of game the system and, and do all this sort of stuff with, with the data that's being collected by them. Um, going, once, going back once again to the media and industrial rhetoric, we often see data-derived systems and interfaces described in terms of uh, magic, such as in this article by Adam Pasnick. Um, which nevertheless also contains a really crucial and telling discursive point that seems to encapsulate a lot of the kind of naturalised uh, obfuscation around these technologies. Um, in a section discussing the algorithmic processing, we see the line, but you don't need to understand any of that. And, and that's probably a fair assumption in that most people aren't interested. Um, but in terms of holding such processes to account, it's not a position you can reasonably support, I don't think. Um, and even when we want to question such technologies, as I do, we quickly begin to hit, as I have, uh, Boyd and Crawford's divide. So I think the work of Will Housley down in Cardiff and his colleagues, uh, which is calling for kind of cross-disciplinary action, uh, it, it is, really, uh, is really important and that can potentially facilitate uh, inquiries of that sort. Um, so moving back towards popular music more specifically, uh, there are questions around the ideas of the labour and the ownership of the cultural work of those creating the two billion user playlists that now form the basis of knowledge generation pursuant to Spotify's competitive advantage. Uh, it also leads to broader questions related to privacy. Um, but more specifically in this case, there are also questions around the role of traditional tastemakers and gatekeepers. So Jones has observed that a process of re-intermediation re has occurred post-Napster with, uh, with technology companies occupying powerful positions in a reconfigured political economic landscape. Um, and whilst the traditional roles of music media so, and DJs and so on were not exactly a meritocracy in terms of what was and what wasn't allowed through, there's a kind of flattening of outliers uh, in terms of data-derived representations of taste that raise interesting and different questions. So, so this Im image from Pasnick's article um, depicts how Spotify excludes particular elements of his listening profile for consideration in the playlists. The highlighted dark blue areas of what is what's considered, uh, that what, the, what their system considers that as he likes, uh, the bits on the outside are kind of uh, are taken out. Uh, but never, this nevertheless has a real world, real world consequences in the sense that a Discover Weekly playlist can influence what a user listens to, and the music they subsequently navigate, navigate through to in the Spotify interface. So, um, as Straw observed, 
Uh, the system's designed to help people cope with selection stress. The selection stress of endless choice can also mean walking the stubborn paths of social division. And as a bit of a pop music evangelist, that's not what pop music should do, in my, in my opinion. Um, so with that in mind, and to conclude my talk, um, I'll kind of try and briefly explain what I'm going to try and do to attempt to address these issues in the final kind of 18 months of my project armed with, as I am, this pile of 8,000 stories that's going to grow again this July. Um, so in terms of kind of theoretical frames, uh, letting the actors speak for themselves is appealing, as is the conception of kind of non-human actors. Um, but it's kind of Dussault's, Dussault's walk, walkers in the city is, is a really powerful metaphor uh, and frame for me. Collectively, the authors of a poem they cannot read whose actions are an innumerable collection of singularities under the panoptic gaze. Um, that kind of leads me to questions of what kind of knowledge could be produced by following these guys, and, um, but by also attempting to harness transparently and openly some of the same processing and analytical techniques used by Spotify and others. So it's, it's kind of a bit of a high, wi high wire act high of utilising technologies in order to critique them. Uh, and I'm not quite there yet, but I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get there. It's hugely challenging and it means accepting my own limitations and picking up the challenge uh, and insistence on the need for collaborative working practices. So kind of towards that end, I, I, I've recently recruited a, a team of, of data scientists based around the States. There's about, there's about 10 of them who have kind of volunteered their time and skills to look at the archive corpus to help me attempt to extract knowledge and insights that maybe more uh, traditional approaches um, to textual analysis might miss, um, with a view to presenting those insights in visualizations and interfaces that will enable um, the people telling the stories to explore the data, which is their data, uh, in, in meaningful ways. So um, I'm kind of, I pretty much nailed my colors to the mast with, with Harkive and, and I'm kind of committed it, to it for the long term. I think there's a lot of scope for more work beyond 2017 when I hopefully uh, finish my thesis. Uh, so I, I, I hope to be working on this for quite some time. Um, if you're interested at all, uh, please do seek me out. I'm here all weekend or, or tomorrow. Uh, and finally, if you're a music fan, please do consider taking part on the, 16th, uh, the 19th of July this year uh, by telling your story. Thanks very much.